Good morning. In the movie Finding Nemo, Nemo ends up in a fish tank in a dentist office, which is obviously where he not, doesn't want to be. He'd rather be in the ocean, reunited with his father. And the other fish in the tank see this as an opportunity, one especially, and so he concocts this plan where Nemo, the little clownfish, would be small enough to fit through the tube and take an aquarium rock and swim up to the gears of the filter, place the rock, jamming the gears, so that the tank becomes filthier and filthier until eventually the dentist has to change it. And the idea would be that the dentist takes out the fish, puts them in separate baggies filled with water, and then while the fish are in these baggies, they would roll themselves off the counter, out the window, across the street, and into the harbor, free at last. And so they carry out the plan, and it works to perfection. The tank gets filthier and filthier. The dentist takes out each fish, puts them in individually filled with water bags, and places them on the counter. And the fish roll out the window, cross the street, into the harbor. And as they land in the water, they're all excited, and they're cheering, and then everything gets quiet. And the puffer fish, Bloat, looks around and goes, now what? And I think it's a question that a lot of Christians ask. Now what? We rise from the waters of baptism, we're all excited, but soon the water dries and the excitement fades, and then the question becomes, now what? And I'm not sure that we always as Christians have a good answer to the question of now what? I mean, we give answers, things like, well, now you've got to go to church every time the doors are open. Now you've got to live faithfully, and, and certainly those aren't wrong answers, but those answers fail to consider the meaning and magnitude of everything that's involved with discipleship. I could ask somebody who plays golf how to play golf. How do you hit a golf ball? And they could respond, you just grip it and rip it. Not a bad answer, but not the best answer, right? Or I could ask a golf pro, how do you hit a golf ball? And he could say, well, it's easy. All you have to do is flat load your feet so that you can snap load your power package. That way you can amplify both lag and drag through pressure impact fix. As long as your number two power accumulator doesn't break down, you can achieve maximum centrifugal force with minimal pivotal resistance. It's just not that hard. But it is that hard. It's not as easy as we might make it out to be. Hitting a golf ball is hard. Other things in life are hard. And our answer that we give to how to do it may seem simple, but putting it into action, not so much. The easy answer is not so easy. And the more complex answer can be quite intimidating. I want you to read with me what Paul writes in Romans chapter 7, starting at verse 14. He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am fleshly, sold into bondage for sin. For I do not understand what I am doing. For I'm not practicing what I want to do, but I do the very thing I hate. However, if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, that the law is good. But now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that good does not dwell in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I do the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin dwells in me. I then find the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully agree with the law of God in the inner person, but I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, the law which is in my body's parts. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. True story. Gentleman, gentleman by the name of Michael Bryson decides that he wants to surprise his wife for Mother's Day. So he loads their six-month-old boy in the car seat, puts him in the car along with flowers and balloons, and he drives up to her place of work, which was the hospital. She was a nurse there. 
And he comes in with the balloons and the flowers and fanfare, and he's got their little six-month-old son with him as well. And he makes a big to-do about Mother's Day, surprises his wife, and she's all excited, and the people gathered around are impressed. But then after a while, it's time for her to go back to work. And the excitement of going to the hospital to see his wife is not near as exciting as loading everything back in the car and going home. And so he places his six-month-old in the car seat on, on the roof of his car, and he puts everything back into the back seat, and he closes the door, and he drives away. And something strange happens. People are honking at him. They're, they're trying to flag him down. They're waving to him, and he doesn't know what's going on until he gets out on the highway and gets up to 55 miles per hour, and he hears a screeching across the roof of his car, and he looks in his rearview mirror, and he sees the car seat still containing his son, hit the trunk, and then bounce along the highway. He pulls over, ecstatic, and runs back to his son and finds him to be completely unscathed. Nothing wrong with him, not even a scratch on it. And then the wave of emotion, the guilt and the shame overcomes him, and he, and he falls down on the highway and just starts weeping. And you know, we read a story like that, or we hear a story like that, and we think, wow, what a moron, right? But I think if we're honest, we've all done some pretty dumb things. We can all relate with the sentiment of being a moron at times. We've all been dumb and we've all been dumber, right? We all know what it's like to do something silly. And Paul certainly understood this himself. You ever kicked yourself for doing something silly? I, I don't know about you, but I've got some deep bruises on me from kicking myself over and over again. And we, we read in Romans chapter 7 about Paul kicking himself, and we tend to look at Paul as like this larger-than-life character. You know, he's the greatest missionary he'd ever lived. He put his life on the line for the sake of the gospel, but yet he struggled just like all of us. He dealt with things just like we do. He struggled with the now what? And Romans chapter 7 is not Paul reflecting on his life before he became a Christian. This is not him looking at his life of sin beforehand. No, this is Paul looking at his life now and saying, I'm still struggling. Paul says that there are times I do the very thing that I don't want to do. I know I shouldn't do it, but I do it anyway. Have you been there? Of course you have. We all have, right? We know we shouldn't do it, but we do it anyway. A thousand times in a thousand ways, we have tried to live by the right standard only to find ourselves falling short. We're all fighting, but we're often failing. You know it's wrong to look at those illicit images on your computer. You know it's wrong. And sure enough, when you log out, you feel the guilt and the shame. You know it's wrong to go to that bar, especially given your history with alcohol abuse. But you think that you can handle it, and you soon find out that you are weaker than you thought. You know your anger is a problem. You know it can get the best of you. But you feel like you've got control over it, and then you lose it. And 30 minutes later, you feel the overwhelming guilt and shame. Every day we wake up with a prayer on our hearts. Lord, this is the day that you have made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. I will glorify you in this day. Lord, help me with my temper. And by 9 o'clock a.m., you've lost it. Lord, please help me not to gossip, and by 10.30, you're slicing and dicing. You plan to live a life for Christ a life of meaningful and faithful discipleship, and by noon, you've blown it. And the very thing we said we'd never do, we did. We all feel the sting of Paul's words because they could easily be our words. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? And if Paul stopped right there, if he put a period right there, we would certainly be hopeless. That would not be a happy ending. But keep in mind that there were no chapter breaks in the original letter. So whatever Paul says following Romans chapter 7 is meant to all be taken together. Paul doesn't get over to Romans chapter 8 and start a new story. This is not a new thought. And notice what he says. Let's go back to verses 24 and 25. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Paul says, I'm a wretched sinner. He establishes that fact. So what's next? And that's where the therefore comes in. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation at all 
for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you have a favorite chapter in the Bible? And don't say all of them. That's a cop-out. It's kind of like when somebody asks you who's your favorite kid when you have multiple kids, and you say, well, I love all my kids equally. No, you don't. Yeah, you have a favorite, right? Okay, maybe you don't. I have a favorite chapter in the Bible. It's chapter 8 of Romans. It's actually in my favorite book of the Bible, which is Romans. And in Romans chapter 8, it begins with no condemnation. It ends with no separation. And everything in between is no defeat. Paul's story doesn't end with wretched man that I am. No, it ends with therefore. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. It ends with hope, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us, for the eagerly awaiting creation waits for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. It ends with victory. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our war, our Lord. So this, this civil war, this tug of war that goes on inside of all of us doesn't end with you being a casualty. It ends with you being more than a conqueror. Because of God, because of Jesus, because of the Holy Spirit, there is continuing victory through continuing struggle. We are all limping disciples. It's okay to admit that. That's not an excuse. It's just a fact. But thanks be to God that there is a difference between a condemned sinner and a cleansed sinner. There is a difference between those two. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light... We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You mean we can walk in the light and still sin? Well, reality tells you that, doesn't it? It's not like your ability to sin goes away when you become a child of God. We still transgress God's commands. But that doesn't put us in the darkness. And I think that's somehow, sometimes how we present things. Unfortunately, sometimes it gets presented like, as a Christian, you're walking in the light. One sin, you're out in the darkness. You repent, okay, I'm back in the light. I fall short, okay, I'm back in the darkness. And I think maybe it's a refutation of the once saved, always saved doctrine, which we don't believe here. But we've got to be careful not to err too far on the other side. Because there is no assurance in that. There's no assurance in this idea that I'm walking in the light and one sin puts me out in the darkness. I repent, I'm back in, I fall short, I'm back out. That, that's not assurance. If that's assurance, then you will never have any, right? The difference is that those who walk in the light have forgiveness, while those who walk in darkness do not. David illustrates this for us beautifully. Look with me at 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 5. Because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So David did right in the eyes of the Lord in all matters, except that one time. David never committed any other sins except the one with Bathsheba. Is that what we're supposed to take away from this passage? Obviously not. Because number one, there has never been anyone who has ever lived that only committed one sin in their entire life. And number two, we have other sins of David recorded in Scripture. The difference is that this, this sin with Bathsheba and subsequently the death of Uriah, was an instance where David was living in darkness. He was not walking in the light. David had turned away from God. He had sinned at other times, yet he was a man after God's own heart. But in the matter of Bathsheba and her husband, David willfully and deliberately turned his back on God. He made a choice not to follow all that God commanded him. This was a high-handed thing. He had opportunities along the way to do the right thing. He could have limited the collateral damage. He could have stopped it at any point. But he was living outside of God outside of the relationship he was living in the dark he could have turned around and made the wrong things right but Nathan had to be sent on the scene to 
bring it to his attention that he was living in sin. He was living in open rebellion. He wasn't repentant. He wasn't facing his sin. This wasn't an accidental sin. This wasn't a sin of ignorance. This wasn't an isolated incident. This was a lifestyle. David, like all of us, had other sins that might could have been dubbed as heat of the moment or, you know, incidents of poor judgment, but not this one. His sin with Bathsheba and the killing of Uriah was a choice to live life on his own terms. And that makes it different than the other sins in his life. That's very different than striving to live at the center of God's will, but stumbling from time to time. The same concept can be applied to us. Walking in the light gives us assurance. We don't have to live in fear of losing our salvation over one sin. We fail, we confess, we repent, and we move forward. We have assurance, we have confidence that when we walk in the light, when we seek God's provision, when we seek His forgiveness that we are forgiven. That's assurance. It's those who refuse to will the, the will of God, those who, who, who abandon God's will that have no hope. That's the distinction. That's the difference between walking in the light and walking in darkness. There was a man by the name of Sky Jathani that was doing a, a group study. And I found the study fascinating because he got together with a bunch of college students, and he talked to them about their faith, about how they viewed their faith, and there were three rules to the discussion. You had to be there, you had to be present, you had to be honest, and you had to be gracious. And as he was talking with this group of college students, all of them were very confident that God was disappointed with them. They had full assurance that God was not happy with them. One of them said, my parents were students at a Christian college in the early 90s when a revival broke out. They were on fire for God, and here I am consumed by sin day after day. And often through tears, other students shared similar stories about how they believed that God must be disappointed with them. And it prompted Sky Jathani to ask the question, how many of you were raised in a Christian home? And everyone raised their hand. Then he asked, how many of you grew up in a Bible-centered church? And they all kept their hands up. And they all agreed that God was disappointed with them. Can you relate? Do you feel that God is disappointed with you? Even though you're in Christ, do you feel that that God is disappointed, that, that he's just waiting for you to mess up so he can turn you into a french fry for all eternity? Is that how you think? That God is still mad at you? If so, then circle, underline, write these words down, whatever you need to do to remember them. Therefore, there is now no condemnation at all. At all. Did you catch that part? There is now no condemnation at all for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation at all. Don't forget that part. You have been cleared of all charges. You have been found not guilty. You have been given full acquittal. You are no longer guilty. Therefore, God is not holding a grudge against you. God is not trying to move past it. God is not still bitter and he's trying to get over it. He's over it. It's an interesting piece of scripture in 1 John chapter 2. It says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Notice that word advocate. It literally means lawyer. So picture a courtroom scene and you have the prosecuting attorney, Satan, the accuser, and he is firing accusations at you. And guess what? They're all true. You're absolutely guilty of everything he's accusing you of. Maybe he shows a a, a short movie or a short video detailing all the, the shortcomings in your life and all the sins that you've committed, and you just stand there with your head down because you know you're guilty of all of that. And yet Jesus steps in as your defense attorney and says, not guilty. He opens up the book of life, and on page after page where your sins are recorded, written in blood, are the words, not guilty. 
Satan continues to fire the accusations at you. Again, they're true. And Jesus steps up and says, have you seen my hands? Have you seen my feet? Have you seen my side? Were you there at the cross? Were you there at the resurrection? I'm here now. And Satan walks away with nothing more to say because he knows that Jesus won. John uses another word here that's interesting. It's it's an ancient word. It's the word propitiation. Sometimes I think that uh, we need to do less of changing these more complicated words and dumbing them down and, and, and more of us rising up to the level of what they mean. And the word propitiation, even though it's a kind of a bigger word, has a very simple meaning. It is the appeasement of wrath. That's what it is. It's appeasing the wrath of God. So let's say that, that Travis and I get into an argument. And it's a heated argument, and we both walk away mad. And I decide, you know what, that argument was silly. I'm going to make amends. And so I go and I get Trav a big old carton of Bluebell ice cream. And I take it to him at Lindale. He accepts it. We hug it out, and everything's fine. You know what I did there? I appeased the wrath of Travis Smith by offering a gift. We're good now. That's what propitiation is. I propitiated Travis By giving him a gift, I turned away his wrath. That's what Jesus did. That is the gift. He turned away the wrath of God. Propitiation is the price of God's wrath. Because here's the deal, folks. Somebody's got to pay. You are all responsible for the death of another human being. I am as well. We are all responsible for the death of another human being. Somebody's got to pay for that. Thankfully, you don't have to. Somebody's got to pay, and Jesus did. He paid the tab. He took the wrath for us. And because he did, God's justice is now satisfied. Because Jesus died, God's wrath is appeased. And if you skip down to verses 12 and 13 of 1 John chapter 2, it reads, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. Why is John writing these things? Well, he tells us to remind them that they're forgiven. Do you think people had a problem with assurance way back when? Sure seems like they did. Sure seems like even in the very beginning, People had to be reminded of what Jesus did and how their sins are forgiven. That's why John is writing. You have already overcome him, he says. Not that you will overcome him. You've already overcome him. You've already won. You go over to 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. It says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So that you may know. Not that you may know someday that you'll have eternal life. No, you can know it right now. You can have confidence and assurance right here, right now. This isn't some future thing. It is, but not just future. It's now. Jesus came to undo the condemnation that was introduced by the sin of mankind. And the reward is not just heaven. It's spiritual security right here, right now. It's the peace of knowing that God is not disappointed in you. There is no condemnation at all. And I think far too many Christians are living a less than fulfilling existence because they still believe that God is mad at them. That they are still the object of his wrath. That he is up in heaven looking down just waiting for you to mess up so he can charbroil you. And I know that preachers of the past did a much better job than probably I do of these hellfire and brimstone sermons. I also know on the other end of the extreme are those preachers who won't touch hell with a 10-foot pole. But in the middle is the balance. And the balance is that the wrathful God became the atonement for our sin that we so desperately need. Make no mistake, a holy God cannot and will not tolerate sin. It is diametrically opposed to everything he is, everything he believes, everything that he does. Sin has slapped God in the face and it makes him angry. Make no doubt about that. However... For those of us who are in Christ, there is no condemnation at all. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Folks, listen to me this morning. Please look me in the eye. If you are in Christ, 
God is not mad at you. He's not mad at you. You're not the object of his wrath. It's time for you to wake up to your salvation and revel in the fact that you are no longer the object of God's wrath. You are the object of his affection. And you can live with confidence in that assurance. You ever seen the movie Moneyball? Moneyball is a great movie. It stars this really ugly guy named Brad Pitt. And Brad Pitt plays the part of Billy Bean. It's a true story about Billy Bean, the general manager of the Oakland A's, Major League Baseball team. Billy Bean changed the game of Major League Baseball. Through computer-generated analytics, he changed the game. And now, from the top all the way down to high school, coaches are using these computer-generated metrics or analytics for the game to get better. Billy Bean changed the game. But at the end of the movie, there's this scene where Billy Bean is sulking and pouting because the A's lost in the first round of the playoffs, and Billy Bean's assistant comes to him to try to cheer him up. And he tells him, we won. I mean, they won because they changed the game, right? And he takes him in his office, and he shows him a video of this very large man who doesn't look like he should be playing baseball or any sport for that matter. This large guy hits a towering home run, and as he's rounding first base, he stumbles and falls, and he's so scared of getting thrown out that he, he crawls back to the bag, and he grabs onto first base, and he, he just clings to it. And Billy Bean's watching this play out, and he says, they're laughing at him. And they were laughing at him. And the reason they were laughing is because he didn't realize that he had hit the ball over the fence. And when he realizes it, he gets up and he's celebrating as he runs around the bases. And Billy Bean's assistant is trying to make a point that I think can easily apply to us as Christians. God's already hit the ball over the fence. You don't have to worry about that. He's already hit the home run. You are more than a conqueror. So quit clinging to first base and get up and run and run jubilantly. Run as a joyful winner because that's what you are. And make sure you touch home because as a Christian, as a child of God, there is no condemnation at all. And I want you to walk away from here this morning knowing that believing that, and rounding the bases with joy. Now, not to end on a low note, but obviously, converse to no condemnation at all for those who are in Christ would be condemnation for those who are not in Christ, right? And, and the Bible's very clear about that. Jesus spoke at length about hell. And it's not a pleasant subject. But here's the deal. Despite what some may say, despite what some preachers may preach, God doesn't want you to go to hell. God does not take pleasure in anyone going to hell. If you end up in hell, folks, it's because you had to step over the cross of Christ. And that's on you. Nobody else. That's not God's fault. That's not Jesus' fault. He did everything possible to clear the path so that you could round the bases. He hit the home run. If you're not going to run the bases, that's your fault. But I want to encourage you not to leave here this morning. Don't leave here this morning without being right with God. There's an opportunity, as long as you've got breath in your lungs, to be in Christ. Take care of that this morning. Respond in faith. A faith that repents, that confesses Him as Lord and, and is immersed in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins. Then what? Then you live faithfully. Then you round the bases. Then you get excited about living for Him day after day. And if you haven't done that, take care of it this morning. David's going to lead us in a song. Why don't you come as we stand? And as we stand.